Hello. Recently I did a video with my tips on how to increase your efficiency and speed up the process of writing a PhD thesis in archaeology. And uh, that I meant that as part, the first part of a, a series of videos on professional development in archaeology. I'd like to follow up this time with a video that's about conference presentations. Going to conferences is a really important aspect of your professional development because it's there that you can do a lot of networking, you can put your work out in front of an audience, uh, and it also improves your job prospects because uh, giving a good presentation at a conference uh, at least sends a message that you might also be a good teacher at a university. So if you're looking for an academic job, it's quite critical. Um, but, you can, but it's also a good way to network and get yourself out there in terms of finding non-academic non jobs as well. So here are my tips for a good archaeological conference presentation. Over the past several decades, PowerPoint slides have become the standard way for archaeologists to present their work at conferences. This isn't necessarily a good thing, and Edward Tuft, author of several excellent books on the graphical presentation of information, is particularly critical. He says that these kinds of slides encourage rapid temporal sequencing of thin information. I don't necessarily share all of Tuff's views on this matter, and in what follows I'll make the assumption that you'll be using PowerPoint or some software like it, but you'll notice I will refer to Tuft here and there. So, here are my tips. I'm guessing that most of you are already using PowerPoint or some similar slideware, and you will have noticed that these packages include templates that are supposed to make it easier for you to design presentations. The trouble is, these templates are truly awful. Going back to Tuft, he says, the popular PowerPoint templates usually weaken verbal and spatial reasoning and almost always corrupt statistical analysis. They also routinize many of the bad habits that I'm going to discuss later in this video. But they're also just plain ugly, distracting, and inappropriate. Some of them have eye-straining moiré effects. Some of them are more appropriate to a wedding invitation than a professional presentation. And their focus on form over content results in a very poor signal-to-noise ratio. That's because only about half the space on the slide is devoted to information, while the rest is either empty space or just fluff. Among this fluff, some slideware encourages you to use clip art, which conveys no useful information whatsoever. Tuft argues that PowerPoint is presenter-oriented rather than audience-oriented, and that its strongly hierarchical structure tells you more about Microsoft's corporate culture than it does about the proper way to make a presentation. Having said that, for the tips that follow, I'm going to continue to use PowerPoint, and in fact I'll use those templates just to emphasize how bad they are. One of the most common problems I see in PowerPoint presentations is that people put way too much text on their slides. And although that might seem better in the sense that it increases the signal-to-noise ratio by presenting a lot more information, there's really not enough time for people to read that information and absorb it, and furthermore, if they're spending all that time reading, they're not actually listening to what you're saying. Many presenters try to address this problem by condensing their text into a series of bullet points. Commonly, they reveal the bullets one at a time, read the bullet, and then reveal the next bullet and read that, and so on. This can result in a really choppy presentation. In full disclosure, I have to admit that I'm guilty of this myself and these slides actually come from one of my own old presentations. And often those bullets are arranged with a really strong sense of hierarchy, with different levels of text and bullet shapes. On the one hand, this gives the impression that you're very well organized, but on the other hand, the presentation becomes so choppy that Tuft likens it to a series of grunts. Large, dense tables can also be problematic. In Tuft's terms, Tables like this are rich in information, which is a good thing. But at the same time, in a short conference presentation, nobody has time to really analyze this table properly, especially when the table is not organized in a way that highlights the most important data. In this table, for example, the fictitious archaeological sites are listed in alphabetical order. 
that does nothing to help viewers see whether or not there are any patterns in the data. At a minimum, you should highlight the important cells in some way, perhaps with bolding or coloring those cells in some way that makes them stand out. That helps people see that it's the largest sites that have the biggest houses and the lowest proportions of round pit houses. But if you're going to use a table, it's sometimes better to pare down your data by sampling it or picking out the most important sites and using those to make your point. However, even with only four sites, because they're in alphabetical order, you can't really see the pattern properly. Resorting the rows on something more meaningful, like the number of house pits or the mean house pit area, results in a table that's much more useful to viewers who want to identify patterns. And here I also vary the type size in order to emphasize trends in the data. However, in most of these cases, it's better to use a graphic anyway. You can simultaneously show summary statistics, graphs of distributions, and images of the things you're talking about. And this makes it easier for your audience both to see the patterns and to evaluate your claims about them. Another perennial problem is that people put text on their slides that is way too small. The fact that those templates default to really small character sizes exacerbates this problem. If you actually expect your audience to read what's on the slides, they shouldn't have to use binoculars to do that. And this is also true of any charts, graphs, or maps you show. The labels need to be large enough for people to see from the other end of a large lecture hall. If people are straining to see what's on your slide, they're probably not actually listening to what you're saying. Another big question is whether or not you should read a prepared text or just kind of wing it on the basis of your bullet points. Reading a prepared academic paper may be more polished and ensures that you don't forget anything. It may even help you keep to your time. On the other hand, academic papers tend to be very formal, and if you read them in a monotone or in a quiet voice, the fact is that your audience is likely to fall asleep. For many presenters, the solution is to skip the prepared paper and instead kind of wing it from the bullet points. This may allow them to speak more naturally and more engagingly, but it also means that they're using the slides as a sort of crutch and emphasizes Tuff's point that the slides are really more for the benefit of the presenter than for the audience. A good compromise is to prepare a text, but write it in a conversational style and make sure that it's short enough to fit within your 15 or 20 minute time allocation. You can still use slides as prompts as you move from one topic to another in your presentation, but they can be images instead of bullet points. And if you practice it enough, you may be able to memorize it so you don't have to stare down at the text. If you must read it, make sure your text is in large enough font as well so that you don't lose your place. And whatever strategy you use, and whether there's a microphone or not, Make sure that you enunciate your words clearly and speak loudly so that people at the back of the room can hear what it is you're saying. And whether you're nervous or not, try to sound like you're enjoying yourself and that you're excited about your research. Look up, make eye contact. Don't just stare downwards at a paper. If you don't engage with your audience, there's no reason to expect that they'll engage with what you're saying. As I've already hinted, even for those who want to use slides as a sort of a crutch to prompt them during the course of their talk, it's better for those prompts to be images rather than bullet points. Your audience will be a lot more engaged with images of the interesting artifacts you found at your site or interesting features in your excavations. But even excavation photos can seem sterile and overly formal. That's why it's a good idea to mix in a few slides that are more relaxed and have people in them. People indicate the scale in a less formal way than a meter stick. And showing people humanizes your presentation and makes it easier for you to engage with your audience. You can also use graphs and charts in your presentation. These should be clear and appropriate and effective, make good use of the space on the slide, and make it easy for your audience to connect the explanations you're giving in your oral presentation with the evidentiary basis for those claims. Whenever possible, you should place that evidence within its context. For example, instead of just showing a graph that has arcane symbols and labels, you can place some images alongside that help to illustrate what the graph is showing you or where the data is coming from. And don't be afraid to inject a little humor into your choice of images. 
Instead of showing a boring table, I could point out that the site is this big, or indicate the size of test pits by using a human for scale. Your choice of images will make a big difference to how much attention you get from your audience. One of the worst and most unprofessional things you can do is to cram so much into your presentation that it's impossible for you to keep to the allocated time. Most conference presentations these days are supposed to be limited to 15 or 20 minutes. When you factor in introductions, walking up to the podium, and hopefully some applause, that means you're lucky if you have about 12 minutes for your presentation. Session chairs need to keep things strictly to the time, and if you're not careful, you'll end up having to talk faster and faster as your time begins to run out. And you may have to omit the most important parts of your presentation, including even the conclusions. Don't force the session chair to have to drag you off stage when the time limit comes. This tendency to try to pack too many things into a short presentation contributes to Tuff's main complaint about PowerPoint presentations. They're thin because you can't possibly develop a complex or large topic in any kind of depth in such a short presentation. So it's important to have a focus topic that you can reasonably cover in only about 10 minutes. And you really shouldn't have any more than about 15 slides. If you practice your presentation ahead of time, keep in mind that the real presentation will probably take two or three minutes longer than the practice one. A common mistake is to waste two or three of your 15 minutes reading out a lengthy list of acknowledgements. Instead, just show a slide that lists those acknowledgements while you wrap up the conclusions to your paper. Or you can show the logos of your funding sources on the title slide for your presentation. The time allocated for your talk is precious, and you'll want to spend it wisely. Given the lack of time to present your topic in any depth of detail, a really good idea is to provide some kind of handout that members of your audience can take away with them. Here, you can provide graphs or tables that show some of your most important results, along with a summary of your project and its conclusions. And your brochure can also show contact information and social media links so that people who are interested in your project can get in touch with you long after they leave the conference. It may seem obvious, but you should be as prepared as possible for your presentation. Typically, you have to submit the abstract for your presentation eight or ten months before the conference actually takes place. Unfortunately, that often results in people not even finishing the research before the conference, so that they're still writing their presentation on the plane. You'll get a much better result if you finish your presentation at least a week before the conference. Then, as with any performance, you can practice your presentation, perhaps using some of your friends as an audience. Or you can watch yourself in a mirror while you practice your presentation multiple times. Time yourself to make sure that you can get through the presentation within the allotted time without having to talk too fast. And if you do this often enough, you might even be able to memorize your paper so that you don't have to read it. That will allow you to present a polished paper in a natural speaking style while making eye contact with your audience. And you'll have a much more positive audience response. I hope those tips will help you prepare better conference presentations in future. I know some of them might seem a little bit obvious, but you'd be surprised how often I see conference presentations that violate virtually all of the uh, things that I mentioned in this video. Uh, and I think you can really set yourself apart if you pr provide a conference presentation that looks really slick and effective. Um, I'm going to follow this one up with some other uh, tips for professional development in archaeology probably including some on selecting which conferences to go to, uh, how to select which journals to publish in, and I think I'll do some on uh, some videos on things like how to make more effective graphics to include in your publications and conference presentations. If you'd like to be informed when I produce new videos, please click on the subscribe button down below. Thank you and stay safe.